Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we uh, do a focused physical assessment on a cardiac patient. I'll talk a little bit about acute coronary syndrome in general and how we approach the acute coronary syndrome. But I'm going to focus primarily on how we do uh, the physical exam. Because I often find when students are doing their physical exams for a cardiac patient, they're doing things like testing to see if the hips are broken and looking for arteria, arteria, and you know, evidence of head trauma and stuff. And you don't really need to look at those things when you've got a patient that you know is a cardiac patient. What we want to do is focus the physical exam that we're doing. So it's just the pertinent things, just the high ticket items that will give us information about our unfortunate cardiac patient here. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of how we approach these people, and then we'll talk about the physical exam. You got two paramedics. One is the attending paramedic. That's the primary person who's in charge of the scene. And then you've got the second paramedic. Uh, and the primary and the second have very different roles. The primary attendant is, is primarily going to be asking questions. They're going to be finding out what's going wrong and doing the interview. It's the secondary paramedic who's going to be doing the physical exam. So when the two paramedics come in, they ensure that the scene is safe. The first paramedic says, Hi there, my name's Mark, I'm a paramedic. How are you today? Uh, what can we do for you? What seems to be the problem? Why did you call an ambulance? When did this start? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Basically getting the information of uh, patient's information, the chief complaint, the incident history, depending on what mnemonic you want to use. Uh, I use, you know, when was it last normal? What we're doing at onset? What's provocative? What's uh, palliative? What's the quality of the pain like? Where does it radiate? What's the severity? And then for T, I do, is this typical for you and have you had any trauma? So those are the questions that I'm asking when I'm the primary attendant. And then I ask them about their medical history, their allergies and their drugs. When I'm the secondary uh, paramedic, I'm gonna be doing the physical exam. Once we've asked the questions and done the physical exam, then the paramedics come back together and the paramedic who did the secondary, the vitals and the physical exam, tells the primary what they found, and the primary, in consultation with the second, puts it together and starts to formulate the treatment plan. So let's say there's another paramedic here, they've introduced themselves to our patient, and they've given them you know, the basic information of what we're going to be doing. Now I sit down and I start to do my focused physical. The first thing I'm going to do are my vital signs. I'll get those done. And then I'm going to do the focused cardiac head to toe. So let's talk about that. The first thing I want to do when I'm doing my focused cardiac head to toe is take a look at the patient's face and take a look at their skin in particular. Uh, patients who are very sympathomimetic are going to be pale, they're going to be sweaty. That's just part of the sympathetic activation. So if I see that, I know their sympathetic nervous system has been activated. And that tells me about the same thing that an alarm going off on a warehouse tells me. For some reason, the alarm has been tripped, something's going on, it's not terribly specific, but the patient's body is aware that it's in crisis, and that's why it set off the alarm system with the sympathetic nervous system. So pale skin, diaphoretic, uh, tells me the alarm has been set off and we've activated the sympathetic nervous system in an attempt to compensate. The next thing I'm going to take a look at when I'm doing the physical exam is the patient's neck. And there's two things that I'm looking for. The first thing I'm going to look for, just because a lot can go wrong in the chest that causes pain, that's pleuritic and can cause a mediastinal shift, is I want to make sure that the mediastinum is still roughly where it's supposed to be and it hasn't been shifted left or right. The way to do that is to examine the trachea. A lot of paramedics, a lot of medical people that I know will look at the trachea but that's insufficient. I've had people with tracheal deviation and patients, and I've looked to see it, and you don't actually see it very well. And the reason for that is because the trachea is fairly fixed up in the larynx, but it moves down at the bottom. So when there's movement, it's not like the larynx is moving up here. It's that the mediastinum is moving down here, and the amount of shift you get at the top isn't very much. So if you want to see if the, the trachea has moved, the best way to do it is to palpate. Let me get closer, and I'll show you. So if you take a look at the chest and palpate on the chest, you can feel that there's this little U-shaped notch in the middle of your chest. That's called the suprasternal notch. And there are two little bumps at the top here 
that go off into the clavicles. So to examine the trachea, to make sure that it's midline, instead of looking, you put your fingers on the suprasternal notch and then move in slightly, well, a little bit, and you should be able, you can see I'm isolating the trachea there, you should be able to feel the trachea and it should be midline between the suprasternal notch. You can kind of mimic tracheal shift a bit by moving your head far off to the side and then feeling. And when I do this, I'm looking off to the left and my trachea has actually moved a little bit to the left, not much, but it gives you the idea of what it's like to have a shift. When you do that, you can't tighten up that tissue here. This is called the platysma, the big platysma. That has to be fairly loose in order to feel it. So if the patient's tightened up, you know, you can't feel anything. So to palpate, that's how you figure out if the trachea is midline or not. That's the first thing we're examining on the neck. The next thing we're examining on the neck is uh, jugular venous distension. I've actually, wow, I'm really, got some good JVD happening there. So in a person who's resting, as I talk, you can see my JVD going up more and more because I'm compressing my thorax. So this is really good JVD going up to around the angle of my mandible there. That's some pretty good JVD, which is showing you that something is obstructing in my chest. If I relax, you can see it goes right down to around here. And now as I start talking, constricting my thorax again, you can see it rising up. Hopefully that shows up as well on the videos, what I can see when I'm talking to you guys. When you walk in and you're talking to a patient initially, if they're sitting upright, their JVD is usually normal level, just around here, you know, just a few fingers sort of above the, the traps. That's a normal JVD in a person who's sitting upright. Do this with your friends. I can't really do it here to show you. But if you lie a person flat, then the blood goes up and congests more. And people who are lying flat should have JVD pretty much up to the angle of their jaw. Try that. Watch it. Actually do it with somebody else so that you can see what it looks like. And it'll help you remember with the actual visuals of what it looks like. So a patient who's sitting up, JVD, this is about normal. It's getting higher now. Around here. And in a patient who's lying down, JVD should be full. So two things can go wrong. You can walk in and see a patient who's sitting up and they've got JVD right up, which makes you think, Something is, is causing congestion in their chest. For me, it's because I'm trying to talk loud because this is kind of a rotten microphone and it doesn't quite pick up the volume very well. Sorry. But for me, I'm trying to talk really loud. So that's inflating my chest, compressing a little bit, and that squeezes my heart, and that makes it hard for the blood to come in, right side, into the vena cava, into my, into my heart. So I start to get a little bit of block backing up. That's abnormal. So that's the first thing that can go wrong. The second thing is in a person who's lying flat, they don't have JVD that goes up to the jaw. And that means that for whatever reason, they're hypovolemic and they don't have enough fluid in their vessels to fill the vessels up. So when you're sitting up, what's normal? JVD to around here. When you're lying down, what's normal? JVD up to the midline of the jaw. So that's what we're looking for in our physical exam. We take a look at the patient's face to see if the sympathetic nervous system has been activated. We palpate at the suprasternal notch to see if their trachea is midline. If it's not, that gives us an indication that there's a mediastinal shift. And what we normally think of in a case like that is a tension pneumothorax, which is pushing the mediastinum over. Uh, then we take a look at the jugular veins. Should be just about a third when they're sitting up, should be full if they're lying down. Next, we're gonna go down to the chest. You must visualize the patient's chest when you're doing a physical exam. If it's a woman that you're doing the exam on, then try to be discreet, but you still need to take a look when you're, when you're uh, assessing them physically. So explain to them, I need to take a look at the skin on your chest. And then we're going to visualize the chest itself and take a look. And what we're looking for is any evidence that there might be trauma. Normally there's no trauma if people are having a heart attack. It's not like people get ejected out of a car and then have a heart attack every time. If they're sitting in their house and they were watching TV when the chest pain started and they haven't had any accident in the last day or two, then you don't need to do a trauma exam. Just focus on the cardiac. So take a look at them. Make sure that the respiratory motion on both sides of the chest is normal. Make sure there's no you know, paradoxical sections or anything weird about their breathing, that they've got normal respiratory motion 
and that they're relatively eupneic, they're breathing fairly well. The other thing to look at is to look at the skin. So if they have shingles, they'll have the rash of shingles, and that can be really painful, and people will describe that as a chest pain. And you can start going down the acute coronary syndrome path, get to the hospital, and finally someone opens up their shirt and says, wow, look at this, they've got shingles, did you know that? And you just go, oh, I feel like an idiot. So don't make yourself look like an idiot. Visualize their chest. The rash of shingles is very characteristic. It's a bumpy red rash. It's usually on one side of the chest, and it follows the dermatomes of the nervous system because it's, a, it's an infection in the nerves. So it follows that there. So Google um, uh, images for it, and you'll see it's very characteristic. Shingles. So I've taken a look at the chest now, and I've got an idea that there's no trauma, there's no uh, abnormal motion, and uh, there's no shingles or rash or anything weird on the chest. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take their blood pressure, but I'm going to take their blood pressure in a way that is a bit abnormal. I'm going to take it on one side, pick a side, and I'll take their blood pressure and check it, and then immediately I'll take the blood pressure off and I'll take the cuff, put it onto the other arm, and take the blood pressure again. I'm taking the blood pressure on both sides of the body for a very specific reason. One of the potential causes of chest pain is a dissecting thoracic aortic aneurysm. So the aorta comes out of your heart, the left side, comes up sort of vertically in the middle and then comes down again. And as it comes down, it branches off into the subclavian arteries. So a dissecting aorta means that the inside um, tissue of the aorta has got a little bit of a cut in it, and the blood is going in through that cut, that dissection, into the layers between the aorta, and the aorta is starting to balloon a little bit, and the inside part is, is separating and coming off, so you can get a bit of a flap coming off of the inside of the aorta. And if that flap occludes one of the subclavian arteries, then the blood pressure in the arm that's being occluded is going to be less, obviously. So if you take a blood pressure and you get a difference of about 10 to 20 systolic between the two arms, then you should start thinking, well, maybe that flap is starting to come off on the inside of the aorta and occluding the subclavian artery where the blood pressure is lower. There's a term for that. We call it subclavian steel. And so maybe your patient's having some subclavian steel. And it's not always there. And even in a dissection, it might not occlude the subclavian arteries, so you won't see it. But if you do see it, that's weird, and it should make you start thinking about this. So in every patient, routinely, check both arms, blood pressure in both arms. And if it's abnormal, 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury, then you start thinking about, oh, potentially subclavian steel, which means potentially a dissecting thoracic aortic aneurysm. So that's the next thing to do. As we're working our way down the body here, we've done face, we've done JVD, we've done uh, trachea, we've taken a look at the chest, we've taken the blood pressure on both sides. Have a quick listen to the chest to make sure that there's no respiratory adventitia, that their breathing is clear. The next thing I like to do while I'm up on the chest and thinking about it is get the ECG on and take a look at that. That'll give me a, a at this point I'm just doing like lead to rhythm analysis. If I need to and want to later, I'll do a 12 lead ECG. But right now, just get the basic rhythm of what's going on. And then I ask the patient to lean forward. And I'm asking them to lean forward to see if that makes the pain any better. Because one of the characteristics of pericarditis, an inflammation around the heart, is that when the patient leans forward, it often relieves the pain. And if they lie flat on their back, it makes it worse. Why is that true? Because when you're lying flat on your back, your heart is lying back and sort of compressed uh, uh, into the body. But as you hang forward, think of the heart uh, like hanging like a sack. It leans forward and it doesn't have much, as much pressure on it, so it's not getting squeezed, so it can move a bit more easily. So the pain of pericarditis, a big inflamed heart, is lessened. So it's one of the things you want to ask about. Get them to lean forward, get them to lean back, see if that changes the pain. Ideally, well ideally, there's no ideal in this situation, but pain that's relieved when they lean forward is suggestive of pericarditis. Pain that doesn't change when they lean forward and lean back is more in line with what we would typically expect to find with acute coronary syndrome. 
So then I go down the body a little bit more, and I'm going down to their abdomen. And at this point, if you can, it's actually better to get them lying flat on your stretcher. But if you want to, you can do an abdominal exam here, or you can do it later once they're lying on their stretcher. It's better if they're lying flat and relaxed, particularly for the abdominal exam. So what we're doing is we're going to palpate into the abdomen just really gently. And what we're feeling for is an abnormal pulsatile mass. So like a water balloon inside their belly that's kind of boom, boom, boom in time with the pulse. If you feel that, and you've got to have pretty good fingers to feel that, but if you do feel it, first of all, don't go pushing it on it anymore. Let go and, and be gentle with them. But what you start to suspect is a dissecting abdominal aortic aneurysm. The aorta comes up out of the heart this way, and then it goes down in through the belly. And if it's dissecting down there, you're not going to get subclavian steel, but you might get a large abdominal pulsating mass. So while you're down there, that's where you're feeling for. You're also taking a look at the abdomen to see if there's any ascites, any swelling because it's filled with fluid. So sometimes you might have seen these 50, 60 year old, usually alcoholic type guys, they've got skinny little arms, skinny little legs, and a great big belly. That's not all fat, that's mostly fluid. If you go into the ER and do like a, a, a tap of the abdomen, you can pull off a lot of fluid. We don't do it because then there's rebound hypertension. But you could actually pull off a lot of fluid and then gradually over a few days and weeks, it would start to fill up again with fluid. It's a seize. It's fluid that's filling up in there. So take a look if that's there. That is uh, one uh, finding that suggests congestive heart failure and a lot of fluid. The other thing that goes along with a lot of ascites is dependent edema down in the lower limbs. So these are people who have the great big swollen edematous lower limbs, which again is a sign of suggesting congestive heart failure. So if we're in the abdomen, we see a CDs, we think about heart failure. If we feel a pulsating abdominal mass, then we start thinking about a dissecting abdominal aortic aneurysm. And just like you could get a flap from a dissecting thoracic aneurysm blocking off the subclavian arteries, you can get a flap blocking off the arteries going down your legs. So one of the things to look at is the legs and see, usually we do this when we lift up the pant leg and take a look at the lower limb, and we try and see if... Both legs are equally of the same color. They should be fairly pink. If they're sympathomimetic, they might be pale together, but they should be the same amount of pale, and they should be about the same temperature. If they're not, if you get like a, a cool, pale limb with another red, warm, well-perfused limb, then you start thinking about a dissecting abdominal aortic aneurysm as well. Have a feel for the pulses on both feet. They should have pulses distally to the feet, and they shouldn't have any edema. Edema, again, suggestive of congestive heart failure. Take a look at their limbs. You should get a nice radial pulse on both sides. You can take a look at their fingers, too, because one of the things that happens with people who have uh, chronic long-term hypoxia is that the very furthest parts of their body, away from their heart, uh, that isn't getting great circulation, will start to really feel the effects of that hypoxia. And what will start to happen is their, the tips of their fingers will start creating new blood vessels because the fingertips are chronically hypoxic. And those new blood vessels actually expand the amount of tissue that's, that's in the uh, fingers, and you end up getting things that look like spoons on the end of their fingers. They get what's called clubbing. And that clubbing is a sign of, of chronic hypoxia. So sometimes you get that in smokers. Sometimes you get it in long-term anemic patients. Sometimes you get it in patients with heart failure where they're not pumping out enough uh, blood to the periphery. But look for that um, clubbing of the fingers as well. So that's your quick sort of head to toe. At that point, you can then do a 12 lead and you can consult with your other paramedic, the primary paramedic, and say that what you've got. What you typically find is, as a team of paramedics, we can roughly wrap up a acute coronary syndrome and do our initial workup in about 15 minutes. And that breaks up nicely into three five-minute blocks. The first five-minute blocks, you're doing your interview as the primary, and as the secondary, you're doing your uh, initial vital signs, and you're doing your head-to-toe physical exam. In the next five minutes, 
you're getting an IV started, you're getting that 12 lead ECG done, and you're starting to ask questions about contraindications to the medications that you think you want to give. And so you're asking about contraindications to nitro or GTN, you're asking about contraindications to aspirin, contraindications to narcotics, and if you want to give an antiemetic, you're asking about contraindications to that. You can get that done in the second five-minute block. And in the third five-minute block, you're generally getting your medications in, seeing how the patient is reacting to them. I prefer to get aspirin into my patient as soon as possible because that's the one that requires the most cooperation. And it's also the one that has the most evidence of making any real change in an acute coronary syndrome in the out-of-hospital setting. We don't have a lot of strong uh, research that supports giving nitrates, and we don't really have a lot of strong research that supports an improvement in morbidity and mortality for narcotics. But aspirin has got some good research behind it. So that's your general approach. You've got your primary, you've got your secondary, broken up into about five-minute blocks. In your first five-minute blocks, primary is doing the interview, secondary is doing the head-to-toe exam, and that's what I just showed you going through here. Practice that a little bit, get good at it, make sure that you can just rattle off that head-to-toe cardiac exam and so you're comfortable with it. As an aside, you should also be able to have a really good head-to-toe physical exam the same way for respiratory patients, for neurological patients, for trauma patients, for ob patients, and for GI patients. Those six, if you include the cardiac, are the six ones that you should have a pretty good focused head-to-toe physical exam for. Today, we just focused on the cardiac. Hopefully that's really helpful for you.